Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the design of marine protected areas and specifically how this decision making process can benefit from measurements of larval dispersal. Um, measurements of larval dispersal are increasingly available, not only because it's possible now to trace the origin of individual fishes, tiny fishes like Hugo does, but also because of the feasibility of biophysical simulations as in this example, and as you can see nicely, and as you've heard before, uh, larval dispersal is a complex process. But it's a process that's very important to understand population dynamics and to assess how populations and fisheries might respond to the enforcement of MPAs. And so if we incorporate larval dispersal data directly into MPA design decision making, the prospects to achieve common MPA objectives should be better. And um, specifically on coral reefs, these objectives include not only the conservation of biodiversity, but often also to benefit fisheries. And there are multiple good reasons for that, including the commonly high dependence of community on, on fishing, um, the common lack of other regulations, but also the fact that MPAs and their design are likely to have a strong impact on species and fisheries on coral reefs. And so, um, Arguably, the best way to design an MPA is to integrate all of these decisions by developing some kind of model that integrates larval dispersal data with all other knowledge we might have. And um, we can then use that model to calculate MPA design solutions to achieve very specific objectives. So for example, we might be interested in uh, protecting coral reefs while also rebuilding locally important fisheries and let's assume that place is Salaya in Indonesia, which um, is an island where I will try and help achieve this very soon. And so let's assume that we know the system, the reef system, and the fishing activities very well, and we can build a comprehensive model that we can then use to calculate an MPA design solution that maximally rebuilds our fishery there. So we haven't asked yet whether that solution is practically feasible but um, what we would have to do is protect strictly 36% of all coral reefs there. And that's a very ambitious conservation target as well. And um, again, we haven't asked yet whether it's feasible, but to the best of our knowledge, we might say um, this MPA design solution would help rebuild fish biomass to a bit more than 20% of what it could be. And also, we might say that to the best of our knowledge, larval dispersal from MPAs to fishing grounds would help rebuild maximum catches. It may take 30 or so years, um, but it would be fully recovering. And what we could also use our model for is to calculate the impact um, on local catch compared to what that catch was before MPAs were implemented. In practice, um, such model-based MPA designs are rarely applied. Amongst others, the data are too often scarce, as you all know, and um, so standard approaches to design MPAs are simpler, often just aiming to represent a fixed amount of habitat in protected areas. And fishery benefits are also rarely aimed for directly, but rather fishery impacts are avoided as much as possible. And the risk with this common approach is that it may miss win-win solutions where many MPAs in the right places and of appropriate size would actually be good for conservation and fisheries. And so um, the focus of my work over the past three years has been to um, develop decision support tools that help MPA design practitioners get closer to such win-win solutions. And whether that's in the form of generic rules of thumb or explicit optimization algorithm, uh, algorithms, and also if those tools can't address all of these MPA design questions at, at once, uh, considering that they're all linked. And looking at the first one, for example, um, how much coverage uh, do we need? Answering this question depends on decisions about questions two and three, but still they're globally ratified targets um, that do not account for any such dependencies and which seem to be rather pragmatic anyway. And um, in, a, in a study that came out earlier this year, 
we addressed this issue with a particular focus on unregulated fisheries. And um, in the paper, we used a framework of models to ask how much protection we would need, um, but by also considering various other drivers of MPA impacts, including size and location of MPAs. And we, we used our results to ask two specific questions. How much protection do we need uh, to uh, maximize the long-term productivity of unregulated fisheries? And on the other hand, how much protection can we have for biodiversity conservation without restricting these fisheries too much in case they are still productive? And um, in a nutshell, what we found is that um, by analyzing literally millions of, of fishery scenarios is that we should always aim for more ambitious protection, specifically if we don't know much about the status of fisheries. And um, our findings are particularly relevant for coral reefs because we were able to incorporate empirical data on reef fish movements. And um, so I think our study is a good example of why dispersal measurements like Hugo does are so important because these data uh, really suggest that MPAs can function as management tools and support conservation and fisheries where that support is most urgently, urgently needed. And um, I'd be ha sorry for rushing through this. I'd be happy to talk about uh, any questions you might have later on. I wanted to focus in this talk on um, a new method that we developed to um, optimize MPA placement based on larval uh, dispersal measurements. And um, I've been working on this study together with several colleagues and practitioners, and um, the paper came out a couple of months ago. Um, and so it's certainly not the first study to address this topic, but I think there are two important advances. The first one is that's a quantitative but highly flexible approach, allowing multiple uh, management objectives to be reconciled. And the second is that um, it's been developed in consultation with practitioners so that it avoids any non-intuitive metrics um, in order to facilitate uptake. Um, and so what I'm going to show you now is an algorithm that summarizes in a simplified format what the approach is based on. So there are three main characteristics. Firstly, local lava retention. Um, which represents the capacity of um, populations to sustain themselves. Larval import, uh, which is the capacity... Oh, sorry. Larval import, which is the... Uh, which are the subsidies that populations we might want to protect receive from places in other areas. And um, larval export, which are the subsidies that populations themselves provide to those in other areas. And then there are multiple parameters which allow users to um, adjust how exactly these uh, uh, main characteristics are uh, uh, treated by the algorithm. And so firstly, they can weight the relative importance of these different main characteristics. And um, they can adjust whether they're more interested in strong or diverse dispersal connections. And um, they can rank how important they think each individual connection is. And so the maximum total value of uh, this objective function calculated across a range of possible MPA design solutions, that value can be used to identify a locally optimal set of locations to protect. And to give you a simple example, let's assume that we have, let's assume we want to protect one out of nine hypothetical islands here, and um, that firstly we're interested in protecting a location that, where there is some level of local retention, so that um, the populations we protect are most likely to be self-replenishing, that we have an interest also in protecting a place that receives larvae from other areas, not necessarily many larvae, but from many different areas, so that in the event of unforeseen disturbance, it's likely to be recolonized. And lastly, let's say we'd also like to protect a location um, that sends many larvae, where populations send many larvae to fished areas, so that we might supplement fisheries productivity there. 
So what we would choose to protect uh, is the center location here. It fulfills all our expectations. And the algorithm would do the same, but the algorithm could do these kind of selections even uh, if it's very complicated and not that obvious. And so that's what we tested in the paper, how effectively the algorithm can do these kind of uh, uh, priority selections um, under a range of management conditions, management objectives, and different realistic uh, dispersal patterns. So this is just one example of such a scenario, but one which reflects the general trend of our findings. So um, on the y-axis, so the aim here was to rebuild fisheries. And so on the y-axis, you see uh, a measure of fisheries productivity. On the x-axis, we account for uncertainty about the mortality of larvae after settlement. And then you see a range of possible outcomes. So if we, just looking at the blue line, if we do nothing, fisheries productivity remains at a very low level. Um, if we just randomly place our MPA somewhere, we might end up anywhere in this graph, but on average, where that dotted line is. If we maximize the amount of habitat in protected areas, we would also see some recovery. But we would fare best if we used our dispersal optimization approach to select sites where there is local larva retention, but where uh, larvae are sent to the highly, to highly fished areas. And um, that result was fairly consistent also if there was, uh, or very consistent also if there were um, other management objectives, say uh, metapopulation persistence. And it was particularly relevant to use the approach uh, when larval dispersal was highly asymmetric, which is probably the norm. And um, there are more examples in the paper, but what I want to show here is the first practically inter interesting application of the approach, and that was to support uh, MPA network extensions in the Sundabanda seascape. And um, so to do this, we firstly generate larval dispersal matrices for a range of species of regional interest, and we then um, use these matrices to identify MPA priority locations that cover 30% of coral reef habitat. That was the aim there. And so what you can see here is an example of the first set of op optimizations where we just focused on local larval retention. And so the sites in red here are those that were most frequently selected uh, across dispersal events for different uh, species. And um, we were also able to measure how good that performance is compared to just randomly selecting uh, sites, and it was two times higher uh, the amount of local retention and it was fairly consistent across dispersal events for different species, as you can see in the arrow bar. And in this particular optimization, we didn't focus on other um, dispersal characteristics, like connectivity between MPAs and connectivity from MPAs to fish sites, so they performed similar to random as expected. But in reality, as we've experienced, practitioners might, might seek an equal balance between these uh, characteristics. And um, so what we ended up doing for the Sundabana's case study was um, to prioritize MPA placement or optimize MPA placement based uh, seeking equal performance in effectiveness and connectivity. And effectiveness was represented by a metric uh, that ranked places based on whether they are likely to tackle dominant threats. So for example, fishing, but not heat stress. And connectivity, uh, as indicated, was a metric uh, representing an equal balance between retention, connectivity between MPAs, and connectivity from MPAs to highly fished sites. And we then uh, did these optimizations using various uh, weights for these two uh, performance metrics to generate a trade-off curve like you can see here. And we identified the best solutions as those situated between the two circled uh, dots here, um, achieving close to 90% of optimal performance for both metrics, so it's not much of a trade-off. And um, we're not saying that this is what practitioners should be doing or need to be doing, but it's one uh, example of how they might define their decision criterion and um, identify best MPA design solutions and plot them on a map. 
And this is then what stakeholders can discuss, for example, uh, by highlighting uh, those areas in red here which are not currently situated within officially declared MPA boundaries. And um, so to summarize, what we've developed is an opt or, uh, objective fun function that is transparent and highly flexible. We've demonstrated that it can substantially improve management outcomes. And we've also uh, generated two versions of the algorithm so that it's compatible right now with uh, popular MPA design software. So we hope, we're hoping by that to uh, facilitate uptake, but um, I'm also happy to mention that there already are 13 MPA design uh, applications of our MPA design works, not only uh, that algorithm, but also including that algorithm. And this follows close collaborations with WWF um, Indonesia over the last three years, uh, including various meetings with us, um, field surveys and priority areas, and very importantly, multiple workshops on MPA design. And during these workshops, we not only uh, train practitioners in the use uh, of the tools, but also uh, train trainers in training practitioners to um, uh, uh, apply our tools. And so WWF Indonesia is now running these workshops independently, which, which is quite exciting for us. And Thanks very much.